Welcome and thank you for joining the Boston University Institute for Sustainable Energy, which I'll also refer to as ISE, for today's Energy of the Future webinar on understanding AI's potential for sustainability, smart homes, and energy justice. I'm Steve Griffiths, Senior Vice President of Research and Development and Professor of Practice at the Leaf University of Science and Technology, which is located in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. It's my pleasure to moderate today's webinar, which covers a topic that is of personal and academic interest to me. In fact, I've had the privilege of co-authoring several papers on the topic of smart homes with two of our panelists, Dr. Benjamin Sobekul and Dylan Fursiker. I'm sure in the course of today's discussion, they'll bring insights from those publications as well as further work they've conducted on the topic. Before moving on to the panelists' introductions, I'd like to say a word about the sponsors of today's webinar. The webinar is co-sponsored by Gridwise Alliance and the Boston University Harari Institute for Computing and Computational Science and Engineering and the student-run BU Energy and Sustainability Club. We're delighted to welcome everyone who's joined us today and encourage you to visit ISC's website at bu.edu forward slash ISC for all the Institute's research on sustainable cities, energy and water systems, and sustainable finance. Please note that today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the ISC website afterwards. Now for a brief introduction of our panelists in the order in which they'll be speaking. First off, we have Dr. Benjamin Sobekul, Director of Boston University Institute for Sustainable Energy and Professor of Earth and Environment at Boston University. Benjamin is not only the Director of ISC and a Professor at BU, he also serves as Editor-in-Chief of Energy Research and Social Sciences which in my view and the view of many others is the leading scholarly publication examining the relationship between energy systems and society. Benjamin's work speaks for itself as he's one of the most highly cited global researchers on issues related to energy and climate policy. Next is Dr. Dylan Fursiker, Research Fellow at School of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering at Queen's University. Dylan's prior PhD work examined technology adoption on household energy behaviors. Before beginning his PhD, Dylan worked at CFE, which is the state provider of electricity in Mexico, where he collaborated in developing and conducting research for the Sustainable Development Agenda. Finally, last but not least, we'll have Dr. Mary Martis Kanan, Senior Research Fellow and Co-Director of Sussex Energy Group at the University of Sussex Business School. Mary is a social scientist with specific interest in sustainability transitions, especially in relation to the just transition to a net zero society. Her current research focuses on the intersections between fuel and transport poverty. Before we begin with the panelists' presentations, I'll offer just a few framing remarks on today's topics to get us going. Digitalization, which broadly speaking is the incorporation of computer-based technologies into everyday business and social activities, continues to shape the world around us. I'm sure many of you see the headlines every day about digital activities continuing to shape the world. Mobile technologies, robots, drones, augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, blockchain, 3D printing, and related technologies are increasingly incorporated to our daily activities. And perhaps nowhere are they more conspicuous than when present in the home. The global market for smart home technologies is currently about $100 billion, and the rate of market growth in years to come is going to exceed most likely 20%, maybe even higher. While this proliferation of smart home technologies can offer wealth of efficiency and convenience, it can also have some pitfalls of which we need to be aware. In today's webinar, we'll learn about smart home technologies and the opportunities and challenges they present when they are widely adopted. We're indeed very fortunate to be joined by our three experts on this topic to hear a very interesting and intriguing discussion on where we will have these opportunities and challenges. Now on to the main show. Feel free to share your questions with today's speakers at any point using the Q&A button in Zoom, and we'll try to get to many of these questions we can during the Q&A session. Now the presentations. First, I'll invite Dr. Benjamin Sobekul to present. He'll be giving a short presentation on the benefits, risks, and policies for a sustainable smart home future. Benjamin, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Griffiths, and uh, it's a real pleasure to see you and that you're still coming here to BU because you did graduate from across the river. Uh, so I think it's very nice that you still have an affinity for other organizations that don't have an M, an I, or a T uh, in their actual institutional name. So I get to go first. Um, it's largely because I was the principal investigator of this project looking at smart homes for the Center for Research and Energy Demand Solutions, which is called CREDS. 
We often joke it has a lot of cred uh, in the UK energy efficiency scene. Um, and that work led to more work that Dr. Griffiths and Dylan have funded uh, looking more deeply at other aspects, which we'll talk about later, like domestic violence and the kind of survey and attitudes and perceptions. So I wanted to start by kind of emphasizing why smart homes are important. Um, they're growing incredibly fast. So you see annual growth rates in smart home adoption of 10%, 15%, 18% per year. So it's double digit growth. And that does mean that you can get some really neat statistics, like the number of smart homes will double, right, in seven years or eight years. You can also see that a surprising number of homes, even today or even in 2020, when we did the bulk of this research, were considered smart. More than 20 million homes in Europe alone um, meet the definition of a smart home or having some type of a smart technology system installed. You can also see market projections are mind blowing. You can see that you know it's estimated by 2030 in our lifetimes, there'll be $14 trillion of economic value that are unlocked or facilitated by smart homes. Um, and again, you can also see that you know future projections also indicate, especially in industrialized regions of the world like Europe, we could see 84 million homes that are smart by the end of this year. So it's kind of like the hidden household technological revolution. These smart technologies are slowly and subtly diffusing throughout all of our homes. And many of us know this because we use them without maybe realizing it. If we have Alexa, if we have automated controls for our heating or our energy, if we have robot vacuum cleaners, all of this counts as smart homes. So to kind of grapple with the benefits and the risks and the policies needed for a smart home future, we conducted a research project, a mixed methods research project, where we began by doing interviews. So we did more than 30 interviews with kind of experts at key institutions like Apple or Microsoft or Google, uh, but also intergovernmental groups like the European Commission, national government ministries, grappling with privacy issues, and energy consumption issues, as well as NGOs and scholars at places like Imperial College uh, or at actually MIT. And then we complemented this, and by we, I should mean Dylan. Dylan hopped on a train and visited 37 different retail outlets selected across the United Kingdom. So Manchester, Bristol, London, Brighton, and Hove um, to get a sense for what smart home options were available on the market as of 2020. And also to facilitate a further round of interviews because we would actually ask, he would ask a lot of the, the people on the retail salespersons for their opinions about smart technology. So this helps complement the expert views with the kind of retail and sales views, the intermediaries who are there to kind of vend to promote smart home technologies. And our first finding was that there is an abundance of smart tech. We had seen earlier studies done in like 2015 and 2017 that was like 67 different types or 100 different types. You know, we identified so many more, 267 different smart home options. And that's only in the UK. And you can also see many of them deal with energy, lighting, gas, integrated solutions. Many don't. Safety, security, drones, robots, clothing. The final thing I like about this slide is the diversity of companies and firms. And here you can see many familiar icons and many Fortune 500 companies, including some of the biggest in the world, Amazon, Apple, Google, Bosch, Siemens, Sharp, Sony, et cetera. So the smart tech revolution is here. It's not something that's you know, happening five or 10 years from now. It is already requiring significant investment from many of the largest firms and technology providers in the world. Second finding is a bit odd, and that is even though you have this flurry of industry activity, not everyone agrees on what smart home technologies are. Uh, you do have a kind of this notion they're digitally connected, so they connect to the internet or they connect to some other type of Wi-Fi or radio signal. You have a sense that they are automated. You have a sense that they allow remote control or enhanced control. And then you also have this notion that they enable learning. And we found that a lot of people think about them only in the first way, that they're digitally connected and not in some of the other ways about automated processes and convenience, enhanced control, or the ability to learn your routines and predict your preference settings for temperature or lighting or when you want to start your dinner or ordering milk from the refrigerator when it's empty. 
And that leads me to this notion that there are different levels of smartness. It's not just your home is smart or not, or it's a dumb analog home or a smart high-tech home. We actually found different tiers that help nuance this kind of spectrum of smartness. Level zero, the basic home is like my home. <laughs> I have no smart tech. We have a lot of people though, who are at levels one and two. They might have uh, an advanced baby monitor or maybe they have an, a kind of digital locking system or maybe they have a smart meter. And then we have a few more that move up the kind of more automated or intuitive systems, especially the kind of high tech people like I'm sure Bill Gates or Elon Musk probably have homes that are in this level. And then you finally have the kind of level five home, which is the sentinel home, which is more like sci-fi. This is the home that speaks to you. This is the home that, that takes care of everything for you and is run with a high degree of, of kind of um, artificial intelligence. We then proposed a level six, which hasn't happened yet because you kind of need levels four and five to happen. Uh, but level six is where you kind of actually integrate smart homes into smart neighborhoods and then smart cities and then even smart states. Uh, so it helps you know, interconnect smart homes in ways that could be even more fruitful at enabling convenience control or in the realm of climate and energy, better energy management systems. And that leads me to our third finding, which is there are a lot of benefits that you can attain from smart homes. It isn't just saving energy or enhancing control and convenience. You can see here, you also have so many more financial savings, grid benefits, feeling better about your life, uh, social benefits like meeting friends or feeling like you're part of a Tesla club or part of a hive club or part of a different club, or even um, enhanced feelings of uh, safety and security or people that just buy the smart tech to get the gifts, the promotional gifts like better Wi-Fi prices or a free mobile phone. That said, um, I wanted to explore three of those benefits that came out in our material more. The first was the fact that they could substantially reduce energy use. And if any of you have been reading the IPCC's latest report, they're predicting that by 2050, we need to see a 50 to 70% reduction of consumption. So in this way, smart homes are one of the key levers we can use to achieve those substantial reductions of consumption. However, it's not just about saving energy. They also enable you to actually uh, be more convenient and live a more comfortable life. And they finally enable you to actually save money that you can then respend on other things that are more important, especially maybe food, uh, education, or maybe even uh, vacations and luxury amenities. Unfortunately, our fourth finding is that these nice benefits come with risks. And actually you can see here, there are more risks than benefits. And let's talk about the three that come up the most in our material. The first is obviously privacy or privacy if you're overseas security and hacking, that they open up your home, right, to malicious actors who will extort data or even worse, hack in and like, you know, control your appliances against you. Um, I remember one of our interview respondents talked about how the smart toaster could be the soft underbelly by which criminal enterprises enter your home. It used to be that have to break in by breaking a window and going in the front door. Now they type a few keystrokes on a keyboard, access your smart toaster and are in your home to kind of steal your financial data. You also have notions of technical reliability and obsolescence. iPhones are coming out every year and a half. And so the last thing you want is to build a smart home, get everything installed. And then five years ago, it's obsolete. It doesn't work. Um, and in fact, some of the tech companies may want it to be obsolete because you have to keep buying and refreshing. It's also concerns about interoperability. If you buy smart tech from Apple, it won't work with Microsoft and vice versa. And finally, even though they're meant to be convenient and enhance control, users don't always find it that way. Many of them actually have to learn how to live in a smart home. You have to learn how to set the settings. You have to read an instruction manual this thick to help you understand how your washing machine works. And anyone who's ever had to program a VCR back in the day may realize it's kind of that sort of learning. Like it's cool once you get there, but you have to build up the tacit knowledge in order to make your smart home function. Finally, and I'm almost done before I turn it over to Dylan, um, we did reach some policy recommendations. This was kind of ways to make smart transitions better governed. And I'm really pleased that Dr. Griffiths helped us with the article that we published here. Uh, and you can see that our recommendations do center on countering the risks. So those risks are not necessarily predetermined. They can be countered by different policy interventions, like better consumer protection, 
uh, better restrictions that ensure they're put to use for sustainability ends and stronger regulations. And you can just see here our respondents are driving this home. We must have stronger privacy protections. We must make sure that we don't enable waste and we must make sure that we enable better communication protocols and regulations as we move from discrete tech into more bundled interoperable systems. And with that, here's just a short kind of where you can find our research. You can see that beautifully two articles are led by me, two are led by Dylan, and one was actually all three of us together in environmental research letters. So you can read there for more. And I'm delighted to pass it back to Dr. Griffiths. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Benjamin, I appreciate that. Um, my video is just kicking in here. So I'd just like to ask you one quick question before we move on to Dylan. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, you talked a lot about standards and regulations, the importance of this. Are you seeing since the time that the work was done, new standards and regulations being developed in the US, Europe, and is any particular region leading in smart home uh, relevant standards regulations? Great question. So we haven't been following smart home standards in detail, but we have been following yeah. some discrete standards. So the example here that I'll give, we were looking at specific standards for vehicle to grid communication. So this is part of a smart home because it enables cars, EVs, storage, and your home energy management system to talk to each other. And I remember we actually looked at the standards, the ISO standards in place, and it was a really neat divergence of standards. So Europe just accepts the standard. They're like, okay, we understand we need these standards, we go ahead. China sought to adapt the standard. So they were kind of like, this is interesting, but we, it doesn't really fit our grid. So they kind of made it Chinese with Chinese characteristics. And the United States ignored the standard because they really wanted to kind of promote their own, basically their tech companies were in control of the FTC and they wanted to promote their own standards. And I suspect that's probably similar to where we are with smart home tech, the kind of American style corporations just kind of go ahead on their own. Standards are set internally, they're corporation by corporation. Europe is more collective. The European Commission, we have to have common GDPR protections. We have to have common standards for charging, energy use, energy labeling. And China's kind of like doing their own thing. Well, they'll like absorb these other standards and then output a more Chinese fit for what they're doing. So I think that's so none are lead. All three regions are leading in different ways. One is leading by communitarian approaches. One is leading with individualistic approaches and one is leading with adaptive approaches. I love about Benjamin, he always knows the cultural nuances behind things. I appreciate that answer. And that's why I like to work with him. I always learn something new from him every time he tells me uh, an answer to one of my questions. And they're always very good answers, by the way. <laughs> uh, thank you, Benjamin, I appreciate that. And I'm sure there'll be more questions in the audience uh, in the Q&A session. Before we get back to you though, we're gonna go to next to Dr. Dylan for Cypher. We'll be giving a short presentation on the household conflict issue with regard to gender and domestic violence and smart home adoption. Dylan, uh, please share your slides and over to you. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to meet you. Thanks for the introduction, Steve and Benjamin. As always, great presentation. Let me share my screen. And can you see everyone? Why is not? We can, Dylan. I see orange. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So thanks again for having me and thanks so much for coming. Today, I'm gonna talk about household conflict, gender and domestic violence in smart home adoption. So I'm gonna start with what Benjamin already kind of mentioned. There are four key components to smart home technologies. However, I would like to divide this into two big themes. The first theme is related with accessibility. And basically this deals with being digitally connected and allow users remote control. The other big theme is related with data. Basically data will facilitate automation processes and will allow the smart home technologies their capabilities of learning. In these two kind of big themes, accessibility and data, you will see during the presentation that basically those two elements facilitate not only conflict within households, but also facilitate um, technology facilitated abuse. So in the second theme, data, I like to think about data as a reflection of our own history, a very personal history of decision-making that looks into the future and basically can predict our needs and our preferences. Smart home technologies often fits into our history 
that in many cases are not compatible with other users' preferences or histories. So when the preferences and histories are not compatible within users, basically, this leads to conflict. So to all this, what is conflict? From a very general perspective, conflict consists of a struggle between people with opposing beliefs, ideas, goals, or values. Conflict also denotes the incompatibility of subject positions. Within the smart home, within the human-computer interaction dimension, conflict is very broad as well. However, I would like to put this kind of conflicts into three big, big boxes. The first box is, in terms of conflict could happen when different users have different preferences. The second kind of big, big box is when multiple applications within one system concur over one resource. And the final kind of conflict that could happen is related with conflicting interests with one user. Basically, this is not, this is not involving other users, this is the technology against one user in particular. And this happens when the user has some preferences and the applications of the technology does not kind of satisfy those preferences. In the most common theme, however, in terms of smart home technologies and conflict, it, it happens when two or more users access the same application but have different preferences. In our research, in addition to the expert interviews, visits to retail stores and the lead review we conducted, we also roll out a national survey in the UK with over a thousand participants. And we also conducted three focus groups. And what we found is that conflict could happen, smart home technologies and conflict could happen with all the members of a household. So it could happen with roommates, it could happen with guests, it could happen with landlords, it could even happen with neighbors. I mean, there, there were some cases that the alarm system woke up the whole neighborhood, you know, so the, this kind of a conflict that it kind of disturbs not everyone in the, not only people in, inside the household, but outside. We also found, for example, that the most common themes related with conflict within kind of this, with roommates was related with thermal comfort and also with ambient illumination. And this kind of leads back to the, what I was telling you about data. So, for example, when you install a um, smart heating system, to kind of provide your preferences at what time you get home, at what time you turn on the heating. So the technology really get to know you very well. So knows your routines, know your preferences, know when you're cold, knows everything about you. However, when a new roommate comes into the house, the technology need to learn these new preferences, these new behaviors. And it takes times. It takes times basically. And this time may during this time, there might be some space to conflict. We kind of realized that the best way to deal with this conflict is not the technology to fix the conflict itself, but instead because it will take longer. So to expedite the process, it's better to reach a verbal agreement within people because this will kind of facilitate this whole transition. Other issues, as I was telling you, is related with illumination and ambient illumination. Some people like brighter spaces, some people, some other people like darker spaces, the illumination can connect to your TV and at certain times you watch so, some TV shows and the other people might not. So, you know, it creates an atmosphere that might not be compatible to the rest of the householders. The other kind of conflict that we identify is in a more kind of nuclear kind of household, to say it in a way. And it entails conflict with siblings, parents and children, and even within couples. What we found, however, in our research is that most of these conflicts emerge from invasion of privacy and also due to monitoring practices. And it is in fact within these kind of two dimensions of invasion of privacy and monitoring practices where the links between technology and domestic violence are the most evident. So basically with the use of smartphones and um, they're becoming, becoming more widespread, technology facilitated abuse has become a prevalent issue. This is all technology facilitated abuse is also known as tech abuse. Tech abuse encompasses the ways in which technologies can be exploited to harass or control individuals. This include unwanted sexual attention, image-based violence, emotional manipulation, or, or of, of, and coercion. 
Um, with the ra rapid growth and adoption of technologies, perpetrators of domestic violence have found new and innovative ways to control and manipulate people. And this takes particular importance when looking at the dynamics of power in intimate relationships. Perhaps the most evident way in which technology and domestic violence kind of concur is when looking at cyber stalking. Cyber stalking involves the use of digitally connected devices to participate in a pattern of repeated behavior that causes the victims to feel fear from their own safety. Cyber abuse involves the use of smart cameras, smart speakers, GPS devices, smart watches, um, spywares to monitor the victim's activity, basically everything you can do, <laughs> all applications you can use to, to perpetrate cyber stalking conducts. And this is basically, again, related to what I was telling you at the beginning. So accessibility, right, is the other kind of key component of smart homes. So nowadays, basically, you can, as Benjamin was saying, you can access any device inside the household to track whatever the people is doing. So before in the old days, not old days, still is kind of of active, but uh, the stalker required like a lot of effort to stalk their victim, basically. They need to wait outside the victim's house or they need to follow them in their cars or they could even hire someone to follow or to track them on the victim's activities. But nowadays, if you have like a smart camera or a smart speaker or smart watch, basically you can have very granular data about what the other people is doing. You can even access Google Home or Alexa and see what they order from the groceries, what music are they listening to, if they order something on Amazon, track their package, everything. You can know everything about the other people's life just with technology. Actually, it was kind of funny when I was reading the, the, <laughs> the lead review to conduct these studies, I found like several stories, well, a few studies, perhaps more than five, that people uh, caught their partners being like cheating on them because they tracked their watches activities and it was like, why are you doing like, why is your watch sending me, why, is, why are you active at this time when you're supposed to be working or sleeping? So it was kind of, I mean, not funny, but it kind of gives some detail about what kind of granular information you can find and how can this information can disturb family dynamics. From the victim side, the key enabler of cyber abuse is related to lack of knowledge. Due to victims' lack of knowledge, abusers can typically access victims' digital accounts and devices and use them to control them. However, it's not all the, it's not all the fault on the victim side. The, a growing body of research indicates that the deficient expert knowledge needed to advise victims about security and safety, along with the deficient legal framework, has allowed this problem to become more pervasive and growing. In fact, what we found is that in the literature is that in many cases due to the inefficient, well, not inefficient, due to lack of knowledge from authorities, manufacturers, developers, and victims, they don't know how to cope, manage, and Kind of resolve this kind of abuse. So in many cases, these kind of crimes pass unattended and unaddressed. Although domestic violence do not discriminate, it impacts all genders regardless of their economic, social, ethnical, and cultural background. It is particularly widespread against women and girls. Globally, 70% of women have been victims of any sort of online violence. In England and Wales, from the 2 million cases reported of domestic violence in 2018, 48% of them included some sort of technology facilitated abuse. From this 48%, the vast majority of victims were women. A recent study showed that one in, although one in 25 people in the United States has had a sexual video or a sexual image uploaded to the internet, the vast majority of cases, and I'm saying the vast majority because they it represented 90% were women. What I'm saying here is not that males 
will not suffer from this kind of abuse. In the literature, we found many cases that males suffer from cyber stalking, revenge porn, online harassment, all sorts of abuse. However, what we identified is that women were more likely or more prone to be victims of domestic by of technology facilitated abuse. Um, and this is perhaps, I mean, the link between knowledge and lack of participation in the digital arena, it is perhaps why domestic violence is so linked to, to gender. So the gender divide in digitalization is also closely linked to the relatively small number of women participating in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics science. Globally, they account for around 30%. The absence of women in the technology world is not only limited to the academic enrollment, but also lack of opportunities to participate in the workforce. For example, the number of women on boards of technology companies is below 20%, and only 16% of IT managers are women. This unequitable distribution could entail other social costs. For instance, lack of access to crucial, transparent, and current information, as well as lack of opportunities for distance learning and teleworking. This kind of two aspects, teleworking and, and distance learning, were more evident during the pandemic, and particularly in rural communities in developing countries. And I think I'm running out of time, so I'll jump into the conclusions. I think that we need a more sophisticated understanding of how these technologies operate in the real world. Perhaps um, manufacturers and developers had one idea in mind of how these technologies could be used. However, users domesticate these technologies to use it them in a very kind of creative and sinister ways. So we need to understand how these technologies will operate better in the real world. I think that Further research should focus on developing regulatory frameworks addressing consumers' protection. This is not only related with data ownership, but I truly believe that we need to enhance the legal framework addressing technology facilitated abuse and kind of build and enhance knowledge from all kind of parties involved in that arena. And smart home technologies do not exist in a vacuum. Our results show that knowledge, preferences, and perceptions remain mediated by, ge by gender, as well as opportunities for abuse and violence. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Ah, and before that, like Benjamin, here are a list of publications that maybe you can find interesting. Uh, all of them are with, with my panelists. So that's pretty cool. I'm very happy to be working with them for some years now. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Dylan. That was a very good presentation. I have one question for you that I was thinking as you uh, were concluding. Have you seen any policies or programs that are starting to bridge this gender technology divide? What's the progress in this area? Yes, um, there are programs and there are policies. I personally think that the best way to bridge the digital divide, it would be through equal opportunities to access digital technologies, for example, education and training. There are some programs, and I think that this is pretty cool, there are some programs that are kind of encouraging and promoting the participation of women at very young age, well, not women, girls. For example, the US Girl Scouts are now rolling out badges for cybersecurity, so that's pretty cool. That's kind of, you know, it's kind of get women to participate, get girls to participate in this area. There are other programs like networks, like Girls Who Can Code, which aims to increase the participation of women in computer science and engineering. <laughs> women in Tech is another kind of network that is kind of helping um, bridge the digital divide. There are more elaborated programs, such as the Equal Partnership Program, that basically aim for improving the participation in decision making in the ICT arena for women and girls. Uh, to promote and advance the role of women in academia, there is the Swan Charter in the UK. Um, and I think since, Mary might know this better, but I think since 2015 or 16, they included social sciences, humanities. So it's kind of a, a way to, um, to help women to advance in academia in these areas. But I think that kind of the main thing that we need to, to understand to bridge the 
gender divide in, in digitalization is to try to see technologies that as genderless, they don't have any gender and also trying to combat kind of classical stereotypes of like males are the only guys to be like geeks or boys for toys. And I think with that kind of idea and knowledge about like not seeing technologies with one gender and kind of combating stereotypes would be the best way to bridge this digital gender divide. Very good answer. It really is making it clear how digitally dependent we are when the Girl Scouts give cybersecurity badges. <laughs> yeah. That's a, definitely, it's a new world that we're entering into. So, uh, geez, good luck to the parents. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Dylan. I appreciate that. So, we're, we're going to close out the presentations with a Dr. Mary Margis Kanan, who will be giving a short presentation on the emotions, social attitudes, and preferences in household technology adoption. Uh, Mary, over to you. And I, I do apologize if I said anything wrong with your last name. I, <laughs> this is the first time we've worked together, so I hope I've said it almost correct. That's um, that's Steve. That's absolutely fine. Can you can you see my um, screen? Okay, yes. now. Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. Right. Let me just put it into the presentation mode. Right. So thank you so much for, um, for Steve and Benjamin and Dylan, and thanks for inviting me today. So um, I'm going to be talking about a um, very related topic, but slightly um, different in a sense that um, this is all about emotions and um, sort of attitudes and preferences uh, for people in terms of um, different technologies when we think about um, particularly sustainability transitions. So um, I just want to start first by really asking all of you that, you know, hello, how are you all feeling today? Um, take a moment to think about, are you feeling happy, sad, excited, grateful, fearful? Um, what's the kind of main thing that's going around with you at the moment? Um, I think it's, um, it's a it's a really important part of our sort of existence as human beings because we actually know that you know we have these emotions and they can sometimes be a bit weird and a bit strange and uh, we all have them so for example today I'm feeling quite happy because there's a fly in the house um, which isn't necessarily great but it's definitely the kind of you know sign of summer and it's the sound of summer so I hope you can get it as a kind of background noise at some point so but that to me is like you know it's a happy sound so I'm feeling quite happy about that so emotions matter really because um, they are also quite essential in our decision making so Dylan was talking all you know earlier about smart homes and Benjamin was talking earlier about smart, smart homes as well you know people might be buying Alexas because they think that they want to be in this Alexa club or you know they might want to get this um this sort of you know latest tech because it makes them feel really good that you know I have this um so emotions are really key in terms of you know how we live our lives and how we make decisions um they can be really tricky to understand um so you know sometimes people might not be quite aware of um of their emotions and they can be even more trickier to research and I think as um for academics that just you know presents a yet another really quite interesting problem to look at um so if we then think about um, sort of, um, hang on a minute, I'm just trying to get my next slide, which doesn't seem to be going, but yes. Oh. Right, so can you see that okay? Um, hopefully that came through all right. Um, Steve, can, can yes, yes, great, brilliant. It. That's good, thank you so much. <laughs> so, so, okay, so most of the time, sorry. Okay, you, you did hear it, okay. Good, thank you. So emotions can be quite tricky to research. Um, so, you know, why should we bother then even to think about it at all? You know, why should we actually as sort of, you know, sustainability transitions and energy and climate research, just why should we actually think about um, emotions at all? Um, maybe we should just, you know, leave it to psychologists in, in some respect. Um, but we all know that there's something called climate change happening. And like Greta Thunberg said, you know, our house is on fire, um, which has caused a lot of climate, climate angst. So people are actually feeling very, very sort of fearful and, um, you know, worried about climate change. And actually, Dylan, Benjamin and myself did a piece of research a couple of years ago on the biggest global climate strike in 2019, where we went to interview strikers in six different cities in four different countries and asked them, you know, questions. For example, you know, how do you feel about all of this? How do you feel about climate change? And people had a lot of fear and they had a lot of um, sort of anger and um, resentment, but also interestingly, quite a lot of hope and particularly doing things like action together made them quite hopeful. So, but climate change really means that, you know, we must change the way we live. Um, and Benjamin mentioned earlier that, you know, we have to considerably re 
reduce consumption. And yes, we might do it via smart home technology, but there's definitely going to be new technology and behaviors that we need to sort of think about and adapt. And we were we already seeing a lot of those coming through, you know, electric vehicles, heat pumps, um, energy re re demand reduction, which is really, really key, should always be at the front of it. Um, so, but all of this change kind of requires social acceptance and, you know, we have to be ready to be to be doing that. So in, in that sense, um, what we did, um, so I did a piece of work together with Benjamin and we did a systematic review, which actually was quite painful. So um, so it's just a research method you, where you basically look at what's been done before, who's actually looked at this from this angle in the in previous literature. So we wanted to find out specifically about how emotions or feelings or sentiment would have been researched in previous the, um, sort of research focusing particularly on transitions and sustainability transitions in the areas of energy and transport um, buildings and housing so um so we got a sample of about of about, about 9000 articles um, and of those about 57 were really relevant to our study that they mentioned you know the word emotion more than three times and they actually kind of had it there more than just you know mentioning it very briefly they actually did kind of focus it on a little bit so from the review we were really sort of interested then to see that um you know what actually what type of emotions are coming up what has been researched before um you know what 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 how has this actually been taking into consideration in in our sort of field of research um and i mentioned psychologists before and they're actually pretty good at all of this stuff because you know they've kind of gone through um previous research um showing that you know there's different types of emotions and there's different types uh, types of um sort of um you know related uh, typologies that you can find and we found a one particularly good one which is um, from Robinson from 2008 where he very nicely sort of um, you know put these emotions into different sort of categories so emotions related to object properties so for example how people might think about or how they might feel about new technology sort of future appraisal emotions so you know how do people actually think about the future and how do they feel about the future then event related emotions um, so for example yesterday I was looking at some of the Queen's Jubilee sort of celebrations massive huge event events in the in the British history you know really big and um, whether you support the monarchy or not you probably feel quite strong Strongly about the events because it's a, you know once in a lifetime situation it really um then also those kind of self appraisal emotions so you know things like pride um and and you know feeling confident um and things like this actually are quite important when it comes to energy as well and i'll show, show that to you later um and then also you know social emotions so thinking about you know engaging with others um and then lastly love which is catches that emotion so love and hate which are really the kind of basic ones um that um all of us really you know at least can relate to and know about so we did a review and we found surprisingly quite mixed feelings about you know what's been done in previous research and um and there are sort of it's really interesting because energy technology is kind of raise both positive and negative emotions in people um, we found actually more negative emotions uh, particularly like i mentioned before fear and anger and this was also the same for energy technology so people for example might fear nuclear power they might be angry about the fact that for example a wind farm is going up in their back garden or near the, where they live so you know really strong sort of um, emotions and it's quite interesting to think about that in the end of the day some of the energy technologies um, we don't actually see in our own homes that you know we just get the electricity from the from the plug but we might feel very strongly about the site where that electricity is being generated particularly if it's a you know a polluting site for example so um but then also you know a lot of desire and gratitude and pride so for example desire for um having for example electricity access you know if you live in a in a country where energy access is not that great um having electricity actually can really improve your quality of life so having that desire to actually have a better life to be helped um, with um, for example poverty re reduction could actually have a really sort of motivating factor for for some projects for example um, so and it's, it was quite interesting because on one hand people might desire and fear energy technologies and this is particularly i think for the new sort of things that we are coming um, you know we are seeing and dylan there really nicely you know mentioned about smart home technologies that you know on one hand they might make our lives really really um simple i don't actually have any smart home tech in my house which was built in 1860 so it's a totally dumb old house um but you know sometimes i think maybe i should get a smart meter but i still even don't have that 
Um, so there is that kind of desire for the new technologies, but then also fear. So, um, you know, cyber stalking and all of these things is actually, it is quite quite fear, fear uh, provoking me feeling for a lot of people. Um, so, and um, interestingly, we found love only mentioned a couple of times and for very established technologies. So people talked about, for example, loving their cookers that they have had for 30 years, um, you know, really old technology and very much sort of, you know, going into social practices in the home as well. You know, um, you know, a parent cooking a meal for their children, for example, with, a, with the old oven. So, um, so yeah, so really sort of um, quite deep deep rooted um, things that people feel about all this different tech that um, is related to energy consumption one way or another. And um, there's a figure there on the on the right that I um, wanted to just show you briefly. And it's um, it's really about sort of, um, you know, looking at specifically about how people felt about um, electric vehicles. And I noticed that there was some um, somebody was um, putting in um, in the chat about Tesla's, for example. So it's it's interesting because on one hand, people might, you know, they might have fear about climate change and then they have desire to reduce the emissions that are coming from their car use, for example. So then they think, well, actually, I really want to get an EV and they might have a lot of joy over, you know, driving a car that is actually really quiet. Um, but at the same time, there might be in the early stages of changing from a petrol car into an EV, they might actually have a bit of fear about range anxiety and just, you know, think about, am I going to get stuck if, I, if I'm now taking a longer journey, for example. So, so it is quite interesting in a way that, you know, a lot of these different technologies, we feel, if we have different feelings about this. And, um, and I think it's important particularly um, to ask that, you know, so what? Okay, so we did this review, we found lots of like, you know, mixed feelings. Um, so what does this actually mean? Is this actually worth us paying any more attention into in a way from a research point of view? And I'm sure that, you know, market researchers in lots of energy technology uh, developing companies will be doing a lot of this stuff. And unfortunately, probably most of them will be men developing the technology and then it doesn't quite, you know, um, fits other genders in a way so but um but one of the interesting thing is that the intensity of emotions tends to kind of increase towards stabilized technologies so you know we know them well we know how we feel about them so for example in january earlier this year um, my old gas boiler finally broke down and i'm i was so relieved because it was causing me a lot of stress that you know in january at the coldest time of the year we had no heating um so you know me and my husband were under blankets for for a week pretty much just trying to keep warm and um you know thinking about you know having a young young teenager as well that you know making sure that um they're going to be comfortable in terms of um having having a warm home so really you know and that relief of them actually having technology that works was just amazing um so you know and the more technologies in our sample actually were stabilized so perhaps this means that you know some of the better known um uh, technologies are actually more researched as well. So, you know, people probably haven't spent that much time looking at new technology from the point of view of emotions. Um, and within sustainability transitions, there's actually very little research that would have actually taken emotions as a starting point. So, you know, it's something that was maybe mentioned as a side thing, or it's something that people maybe, you know, mentioned in their conclusions, but actually as a starting point for a research project, there wasn't really many projects that we found out. Um, and I do think that we need to find out and understand a lot more about how people feel about new technologies and their adoption. I mentioned, you know, electric vehicles there. Heat pumps is another one, for example, now in the UK, it's a massive sort of um, issue in the media and um, in public sort of debates about moving over from gas boilers to heat pumps and people might worry about performance, you know, what kind of building do I have to be living in? So, you know, people tend to have concerns about new technology. Um, same with, you know, solar PV, people might think about, you know, intermittency, uh, what happens when the sun doesn't shine and all these sort of concerns, but also excitement about new, new things. Um, and I think particularly, you know, for early adopters, it would be really interesting to look at, you know, what is the difference between those who are early adopters and those who kind of adopt later that are the early adopters, like, you know, the really excitable people who just think that actually this is fantastic. I'm just going to try it because I'm so excited about it and I just desire this technology and I want to, want to try it out. Um, so, so that's kind of, I think, um, would be one, one sort of interesting piece of research to be done in, within the kind of energy transition context. Um, and one of the most sort of um, 
interesting one, I, I think, also is that, you know, will people actually be happy to give up all their polluting technology that they love? And one of the things, um, I am originally from Finland. I've been in the, living in the UK for a very long time. And in Finland, for example, fireplaces and burning wood has a massive cultural connotation. It's loved, you know, the forestry um, industry is huge. Forests are loved and, you know, burning wood and having a fireplace is just like people love them. So, but what about particles? What about pollution? And we now know a lot more about air pollution, for example, that fireplaces, particularly burning wood, is not great. So what will people do? It's very different to sit around a heat pump, potentially maybe just a box on the wall than a really nice glowing fire. So, you know, there are some of these things that we need to think about that, you know, what will people do? Um, will they happily give up some of their sort of, you know, loved technologies, for example, and big cars in the US, for example, very, very relevant, isn't it? Um, um, and also, you know, I mentioned boilers in the UK. So, so yeah, so just something, something to think about. Um, and just lastly, to say that, you know, sustainability transitions require new ways of living. Um, and I think it's really important to know how we feel about that. And as a researcher, I would always think that, you know, would be really great to do some more research in this area. So I'll leave it at that and um, look forward to taking your questions. Thanks, Mary. I really appreciate that. Very interesting topic. I have a question for you before we get into the Q&A with all the panelists. I, I, from your, your your views of the of the attitudes and emotions over the past couple of years regarding sustainability transitions, have you seen a change since the focus on climate change and sustainability has been increasingly prominent in the media and the, in, the, in the dialogue? Is this an evolving uh, way in which people are perceiving the world and, and, and affecting the way you're seeing the research outcomes? Um. <laughs> I think there probably is a change. I think people are a lot more aware and people have, like I mentioned before, you know, there's a lot of climate change anxiety. There's a lot of angst about that. I do think that, um, you know, awareness about us needing to change the way we live is really, really high. But at the same time, people are still doing a lot of those behaviors and a lot of that kind of high consumption that is leading to that. And they haven't really been giving up on certain things. And now we tend to be focusing that, okay, cars for instance are polluting so we are just talking about people moving into electric vehicles rather than thinking well can we reduce travel and our need for cars in the first place can we actually start by reducing consumption rather than say well here's a new clean tech that will still require materials and energy to be built and to be manufactured that you know let's just swap it to that one so i do think that there's still a massive the sort of debate that we have to have to make people realize that actually we have to reduce consumption first and we have to reduce energy consumption first that we can't just swap one technology into another technology you know that's just not going to be sustainable in the long run um so so yeah but let's see i have hope <laughs> <laughs> very good it's good to be hopeful so now we're going to move into the q a session with our presenters i'll ask uh, dylan and benjamin to turn their cameras on and Stay muted while uh, others are speaking, but otherwise, when your um, time to come to speak, please go ahead and unmute. I'd like to remind the audience that you can submit your questions through the webinar Q&A function, and I will get to as many as possible. We have several questions here that I think are of interest. Uh, one question, I'm gonna, I, I, you know, I've alerted Benjamin to a question I'm gonna ask, but before I get to that one, I have one question that maybe all the panelists could um, give their perspective on because it intrigued me as I looked at some of the questions I heard you talk. The definition of smart home. I've seen people in the chat, they've said that you know, they have an Alexa speaker or they have some type of technology and they didn't realize they had a smart home until they heard the discussion. Is the definition of home, is the boundary changing? The more we see that we have homes and vehicles that are smart, we have wearable technologies that were you know, we have Apple watches and we have aura rings and health tech is coming in. It is where, what is the definition? Is it's expanding? Is the, is the smart home, what is it? Does it include your car? <laughs> it's just, just trying to get a boundary. Anybody would like to take that as a, as a first question? Sure, Steve, I, I will. Um, partially. So two reactions. The first is that um, when we did ask, we did the survey and we asked respondents how many smart home technologies they have, actually most people had some. So that already implies that um, a few had none, a few had one, one person put 500. 
<laughs> and then oh, the rest yeah. were like, yeah, the rest were always between like, you know, 15, 10, 15, but it does imply that people are adopting them. But more to your point, we came across a great article that tried to conceptualize what a home is and notions of the home. And it was by this person called Kier, Kirsten Graham Hansen and Sarah Darby, both very good social scientists. It's called Home is Where the Smart Is, as opposed to Home is Where the Heart Is. And they talked about how there are actually four notions of home uh, and that they intersect. So the first one is it's a place for security and control. So it's a place where you, it's a like king of the castle. You can be safe. The second is it's a hidden place for private activity. So it's a place where you rest. It's a place where you're intimate with your partner. It's a place where you don't have to act like you do in professional places. Um, third is it's a place for hosting and relationships. So it's like a hotel, except you have your in-laws come through. And then finally, the fourth notion of a home was that it's um, an expression of your identity and values. So rich home, poor home, big home, small home, you have a garden, landscaping. So, it, you know, you can just tell the home is like another, it's like your clothes. And I like that all four of those different notions of home lead to different applications of smart home tech, as well as competing notions of what a home is. And what Graham Hansen and Darby conclude is that the home is all four things at once. And that makes it incredibly complex to regulate. Because if you think a home is only one of those four, people are still operating on the other logics that can countermand what you're trying to do. That's a very complete answer. I know Dylan or Murray, would you like to add to that or will you Michelle, move on to the next question? All right, Benjamin, I'm gonna to come to a question that is somewhat academic, but I think it'll be insightful if you can give us the response to it. The first question was asked, and you've probably seen it in the chat. It was regarding uh, whether or not you've done a stratified analysis for affordable housing and the prevalence of smart tech and perception of the benefits and risks that are likely differential, but help, could help prioritize policies and standards with an equity lens. Would you like to take that one? Great question. A very easy answer, which is no. The research was mostly qualitative, so the interviews and all that. And we were actually, I mean, the, the interviews, the first phase anyway, what didn't even involve homeowners. The first phase was expert interviews actually- and retailers. For the survey, we did have a nationally representative sample of homes, about a thousand, but it was not representative in terms of income. They could only guarantee us representativeness for gender, household size, and location. And I remember in particular, we were excluded from doing social housing blocks, which are basically like poor homes because of, of, of the data provider and ethics reasons. So it's even worse. It's like our sample was stratified the other way towards wealthy homeowners or middle class homeowners. I think that a stratified sample among low-income households would be fantastic to do. Um, we didn't do it in this project. So, Benjamin, you've done a lot of research. It looks like you have one more thing to do now. <laughs> I thought Benjamin had done it all. That's, that's just someone out there really is. They got you, man. <laughs> well, Dylan, I mean, Patricia's comment is apt, and uh, but Dylan has done qualitative research with vulnerable groups. And so there he's actually worked with three very low-income communities to learn about their experiences with energy and mobility although it's not smart tech. But Dylan, do you wanna just spend maybe a minute telling about the three communities you've worked with? And did you see any smart tech in those communities? No, definitely. That, that's something that it t- didn't go through. Like actually what I was telling you, for example, in terms of opportunities and teleworking and distance learning, actually what we found is that at least in rural, commun- well, not rural, but in the outskirts of Mexico city, like most girls and kind of adolescents didn't go to class because they didn't have any technologies to access the internet. And in their homes, how many homes did we visit? Perhaps more than 130 homes in total in three locations or around so. I couldn't find any smart device, not Amazon Alexa, uh, any kind of tech device that we could identify as smart home we I didn't find any um so yeah no it's it's completely marginalized and I think that kind of this goes back to the digital kind of divide but in terms of poor or low-income families against the more kind of well-off you can see the stats 46 percent of the worldwide population does, doesn't have access to the internet yet so we're kind of lagging there. Very good, Dylan. And I'm, I'm sorry to jump in, Steve. I, d- I know the panelists so well. 
Mari is also leading a project on fuel and mobility poverty. And so Mari, I know you've also done household interviews. Anything to say here about smart tech and income disparities and equity? Yeah, I mean, a few people that we interviewed had um, had smart meters, for, in, for instance, and um, and they were sort of, um, you know, quite quite happy with them. But unfortunately, it tends to be at least in the UK. So we, we are doing a study looking at um, energy and transport poverty across the UK in all four nations, um, Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland and England. And unfortunately, in the UK, we have prepayment meters. And a lot of the time, people who are on a low income who don't necessarily have a good credit rating, for example, they have a prepayment meter where you feed the meter all the time. Um, and that is not smart tech at all. It's actually quite crude technology because, you know, um, and it's also very, very um, unfortunate because you can be in the middle of having a shower and your meter runs out and, you know, so, and it causes people a lot of stress as well when, when you have to constantly think about how you kind of, you know, feeding the meter as we, as we say here. Um, so, but not much smart technology um, in, in that sense, really. So, yeah, thanks. Well, based on what you said about the adoption of smart technology, I'm gonna to come to one of the questions which will maybe be an extension of this conversation. Question was, uh, what's the cost effectiveness, uh, the cost effectiveness of, of smart technology? It sounds like not everyone's uptaking smart tech. So are they cost effective or just convenient? Uh, any responses to that? I think it's great that Mari's work shows that it's sometimes about emotions. So it's not even about rational right. calculation. It's about how they make you feel, you know, including like the high tech adopter who gets it to impress his girlfriend, right? Or something like that it has nothing to do with cost. So there are other logics, you know, convenience, right. control, conspicuous consumption. Um, I've seen some good work about the cost benefit analysis of the smart meter program. So that's a kind of subset of smart tech. It's one type. And there I know that the energy ministry there is called BASE, Business Energy Industrial Strategy. They have projected there is a net cost savings as you roll out smart meters, but most of them aren't among the households. Most of those savings are actually to energy suppliers or network operators, like two thirds. So that implies there are net social benefits, but it's not actually accruing at the level of households who are only saving one to 3% of their energy. And there are some households that have negative cost returns if their smart meter fails or they don't use it or they have rebounds in consumption. And I think that kind of goes back into the notion of, of the different logics. Under some logics and those who are sustainable, there will be dividends socially, environmentally, financially. But for other homes who don't give a damn about that, there will not be. And it's telling in one of our other studies that we did, we found that once people adopt solar energy, they actually have up to a 30% rebound in increased consumption because they feel better. So because they bought solar energy, they buy a tumble dryer, they buy an EV, they buy a vacation. So you have direct energy rebounds and you have indirect as well because they save money from solar and then spend that money on a trip to Fiji. So the kind of moral licensing aspect, as well as the direct energy rebounds, really do unpack the complexity here. And this is why under some configurations, smart home technologies are bad for the climate, they're bad for households because they contribute to excessive spending and waste. Can I add to, can I add to that a little bit? If you think about, for example, how Facebook started, and now thinking about how much money they are making from data. So, you know, I am still kind of thinking, where's all this smart tech data going? Who's making money from it? Someone is making money from it. What's going to be the end use for it? And like Dylan mentioned earlier, or maybe it was Benjamin who mentioned earlier that um, you might get into a cycle of having to replace your tech every few years because of you know software issues. And it also means that it means you have to have an internet access and not everyone can have that. You know, there are a lot of people around the world who don't have access to the internet. So it's a very also, you know, global north view of uh, kind of, you know, wealthy view in a way on, on, on this sort of technology that um, everyone can sort of have them because it kind of requires you to have certain level of income and access to other issues like internet connection before you can have that. So, but I would just be asking always, where's my data going? Who's owning it? Are they making money from it? And to that point, a question that came across my mind was related to one of the questions I've seen in the chat. When you have smart technology and you decide to sell your home, sell your car, whatever, sell whatever your smart tech is, whatever is, is encompassing the smart tech, is it possible to erase the data? Or is it really the matter that you, know, you can never really be sure that the data are not already 
gone off to a place where they've been stored without your full knowledge? Is it some, some use of the data that's already sort of compromised your privacy? I mean, maybe this is geographically specific. Maybe this is something that um, standards and regulations in different regions or different countries handles better than others. Is there any perspective on that? I guess the answer people are looking for is, can I just wipe the data? Is, or is that is it already too late in some context? The data has already gone off for, for a use that you didn't uh, have awareness of. I Dylan, think, you, uh, yeah, I think what, kind of splitting this question into two answers. What we found also is that people see value in having like smart home tech built in their homes so they can see that the value of the home may increase if they are kind of built for smart home tech. So that's kind of a perception that we found in the focus groups. And also I think most of the technologies by default, they are able to be like rebooted or reset. So I think that's kind of ingrained within the technology. However, the data that you already kind of gave away, it's flying somewhere and you don't own that data. Basically, that's kind of one of the policies that we're trying to kind of encourage is data ownership, because once you give away the data, then it's somewhere else, it belongs to someone else. And this kind of links back to the meaning of home as well. Like now you can see like big companies that are entering your home where it used to be a very private setting. Now you can see like Google sitting in, next to your bed or in the entrance of your home. And that's a way of colonizing homes. And I think that's kind of changing what the home really is. But the data, yeah, I think you can reset everything and then it should be good to go. Dylan, I want to stay with you. There's a question, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, someone asked, can we design the smart home to detect and report domestic violence? So could you essentially have the automated uh, AI based 911. Is, have you seen anything, any attempt? I have some thoughts on that myself. <laughs> Maybe yes. you want to give your thoughts on that. <laughs> I think that, for instance, Alexa reacts to certain commands. So if you say help to Alexa, it might actually, if you program Alexa to do that, it, I think it could call directly to 911. There are other technologies that I found pretty cool, like the smart, the, the dress for respect. Basically, it's a dress that can sense how much pressure is put into the dress. So if a person is being kind of violent, like someone is being like abused, the dress could sense that and will send a signal to your contacts and the police. There are also like underwear that if it's removed violently, it could also send a text to your contacts, your closest contacts, and you can program that kind of underwear to send a message to the police. There are other kind of um, technologies to prevent abuse that I think that I cannot remember, but most of them are wearables. So that dress for respect is the one that it calls, like that I remember the most, and this underwear that if it's like rip apart violently, it sends MSS. I was just thinking it might be interesting to consider what is, how would you detect domestic abuse? I mean, you have different cultures where you never, I mean, <laughs> what, what is, goes on in the household of one may not be considered abusive in another. So, you know, that may be one of those challenges of using an artificial intelligence type of detection system. So it, it does come, that's a whole other set of questions, but it's certainly that, that, that particular um, question to you is one that made me think, um, some potential interesting research opportunities there. We have a few minutes left. I, I have one question. I'm gonna to go to Mary, because you had a very interesting presentation and we'll see if we can get any more after this. Uh, Mary, there was a question that came in. What is, the, what is effective to be done to encourage people to move away from fossil fuels, to encourage leaders and communities to begin the move? Uh, someone here has asked the question, the town's dragging the heels no matter what the energy committee does. Do you have thoughts on that, Mary? That's a really good question and it's a tricky question because it is really hard and there's so much vested interest in fossil fuel companies, you know, they have so much money invested in their infrastructure that it's going to be taking time, the change will take time, but we now know that, you know, that's, we can't keep doing that because of climate change, so I think um, 
in terms of how do you convince people? I think this is a really good question and I don't have the answer to do it for that in terms of this is how you do it. But I do think it's really important um, to get communities involved, um, to actually have the local people involved and trying to get them to actually see that this is really important. And also elect representatives that actually want to move away from fossil fuel fuels. So if you can vote, go and vote and go and vote for politicians that will actually go for the change. So whether it's your city council or your town council or your regional, regional um, sort of electives or your members of parliament. So I think it's really important to do that. Um, find the right representation so that policy can be changed. Um, and, um, and, you know, in your own home, if you can do it, move away from fossil fuels at your own home. So, you know, in, invest into a heat pump or um, see where you can reduce energy demand um, first, um, insulate and do the usual, usual things and think about whether you need all the uh, different appliances that you have at home. So, so um, I think, um, but it's a really good question and it's really tricky and that sort of, convincing decision makers can be quite tricky but I think we are now moving you know and un the unfortunate war in Ukraine is showing also that you know there's a there's a big push now for net zero um, because it's also about energy security you know um, so it's also about people making sure that they have their own um, resources nearby at home so I don't know if Dylan or Benjamin wants to add to that Very good response. And unfortunately with that, I see that we're coming up against the end of the session. We probably just have about a minute left, although I think we can go on for quite some time. There were a few other questions. I apologize for those whose questions I may not have gotten to. Um, definitely an interesting dialogue today. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for joining us today and providing these very thought-provoking questions for the panelists. And of course, many thanks to the panelists. You've done an excellent job with your participation. So I really appreciate that. I thank again the sponsors, the Gridwise Alliance, our BU partners at the Harari Institute and the Energy and Sustainability Club. Thank you very much for the support for this event. Uh, and this brings us to a close of the ISC Energy of the Future webinar series this spring that was focused on AI and sustainability. You will find all of the recordings at bu.edu forward slash ISC forward slash spring two two. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Fantastic Steve. Fantastic job, everybody. Good yeah. See you, everyone. Have a have a great afternoon. Thank, Thank you, you Steve. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. bye, -bye.